Welcome to the other world. After making multiple Story Explained videos, I wanted to jump back in on another RPG Maker horror title, Misao. There are dark and mature themes in this game, so be warned going into it if you choose to continue watching. Our protagonist Akito is having a nightmare. He hears the voice of a girl call to him. Help. Find me. He knows this voice. It's Misao, his classmate. Akito wakes up and recalls Misao. He says she was always a lonely girl in his class and that he always wanted to be her friend, but three months ago, she went missing. He shakes the thoughts out of his head and hopes she's okay. Akito makes his way to school for the day. During class, however, he knows it didn't work. He can't stop thinking about the dream he just had. Was Misao actually calling for him? After class is over with, we're introduced to the other characters. Ayaka is a blonde-haired girl who seems peppy and overall well-natured. She's talking with the main character, signaling that they must be friends. She has a big crush on the cool, calm, and collected teacher of theirs, Mr. Karata. She says there's a rumor that the teacher has a thing for hands and applies some lotion to her own. Next up is Yoshino. She talks about some weird events happening at the school, like the gym lights falling. She seems more like the drama type and wants to push the narrative of ghosts. Toma says it could be the curse of Misao, and Yoshino jumps on the train, saying that these events started right when she disappeared. Toma seems more carefree and playful. He says maybe Yoshino will be cursed next since she bullied her. Yoshino bites back that Toma did too. Saotome, coming off as more of the ditzy blonde popular girl, asks Toma to protect her since they're dating. Yoshino gags at the sight of them hugging. The last character is Kudo, who seems much more reserved. He barely speaks besides mentioning the gym lights. He doesn't seem to add in any opinions of his own. Rumbling comes from the school and they all jump at the sudden occurrence. The old school building's floorboards and porcelain walls shake like some catastrophic event is happening. Akito's head starts to hurt during this. Flashes of a girl screaming appear in his mind. The lights in the building go dark. Something is wrong here. Akito hears a voice call for help again. He says out loud that Misao is talking to him. Everyone starts freaking out. Toma says he's going crazy, and pictures of a girl in pain flash in and out. One last blood-curdling scream is heard before everything goes pitch black. The rumbling noise ends. Silence. Ikito wakes up after some time to find the school he was once in completely overturned. The desks and chairs have been scrambled. Items like rackets and bags have fallen off of counters. It's like an earthquake devastated the entire infrastructure. In the corner is Yoshino cradling herself against the wall. Okito tries to talk to her, but she mentions Misao's curse and screams out of frustration, running away. Akito leaves the classroom and sees the silhouette of a girl. It looks like Misao. She's just standing there. Approaching her, she disappears out of sight. The building looks like a wreck. Parts of the opaque tiled floor are completely gone and the holes seem like they lead to some sort of black void. He's going to need to watch his step from now on. Continuing down the stairs, he finds Toma and Saotome safe and sound. They're scared and running from something down the hallway, though. There she is again, at the other end of the hall. It's Misao. She's crying with her hands in her face. She turns around towards Akito. Her head rolls off her shoulders, and the darkness behind her encroaches. Akito runs and bumps into Kudo. Kudo claims everything that's happening is his fault and that he'll take responsibility. Once again, nobody takes heed of Akito, and he walks off. Bloody footprints have followed Akito all around the school. They push him into a black pit that opened from one of the tiled floors of the school's hallway. He doesn't die though, he ends up in the school staff room. Inside is a bald-headed man in a dapper suit with piercing red eyes. His name is Onigawara. He states that the school has been sucked into another world. He confirms the curse of Misao is real, and another character busts through the door, her name being Library. Yes, that is her actual name. She says the school is overrun with hostile spirits and that they're completely locked inside. After meeting the two of them, Onigawara asks Akito his intentions tonight. Akito responds that he plans on saving Misao, and for whatever reason, that appears to have delighted Onigawara in some foreign way. Onigawara adds one last thing. He says that he could dispel the curse and save the girl's soul, but when the time comes, he'll know what to do. That's all the information he could give us for now, but it's hope for salvation out of this place. Akito is pleased that he can help Misao in some way, since he wants to be her friend, but puzzled at the comments of Onigawara. 
There's no time to sit around though, Misao's waiting, and Akito departs. On the third floor, he heads north and makes his way into a computer room at the end of the corridor. It's Saotome, she's being attacked by a severed corpse. It's cut in half from the waist up and it's crawling towards her. The sight is hideous, it's pulling blood and entrails from the back. She screams for Toma's help, but he's on the other side of a large gap with the void space in between them. Without rational thought, Toma screams out of fear from the situation and flees the scene, leaving his girlfriend completely alone. He passes Akito on the way out. Saotome watches him leave her and yells his name one last time from the pain of what just occurred. The half-corpse lurches forward almost at her feet now. Ikito busting into the scene sprints around trying to find out how to reach her and save her. He finds a fire extinguisher outside the door and rushes back inside. When he reopens the door however, Saotome is lying face up. The creature is completely on top of her, chewing and gnawing. It's eating her alive. Well, ate her alive. She's already dead. Ikito, out of rage for his friend, still blasts the creature with the extinguisher, banishing it away. His friend is dead, he couldn't do anything to save her. Wallowing in defeat, a scene now plays. It's a memory of the past. It shows Yoshino toying around in the classroom with everyone. She claims Misao had a crush on Toma in front of everyone to hear and to make her uneasy. But to everyone's surprise, Toma says he likes her too before she can even speak. They trade phone numbers and Saotome watches the scene. Misao thinks they're dating now and gets a sense of extreme happiness for once. The next day, Misao comes to school to find a note in the main hall. It has every embarrassing text she sent Toma on display for all to read. She runs away in humiliation and to the classroom nearby. Inside sits Saotome on Toma's lap. They're all alone inside. The two of them are fooling around and Toma claims Saotome is the one who put the text on the blackboard and they find humor in it. The memory ends and Akito saw it all somehow. Still in the computer room, he watches as Saotome's soul leaves her body and flies off somewhere. Still reeling from the fact he couldn't help, he runs off to end this tragedy as quickly as possible. He chats with the library a bit more and they become friends. She apparently is not a student like them and is a resident of this other world. They chat, but ultimately she's just a spectator on all this, along with Onigawara. Down on the first floor, the next person Akito finds is Ayaka his cheerful friend who he was gabbing with before all this began. She's in the teacher's lounge, sifting through Mr. Karata's desk. She finds some love letters that she sent him a while back and gets embarrassed. Ikito tells her to knock it off and that the school has fallen to pieces, this is no time to be messing around. He refrains from telling her about what he just witnessed upstairs, however, since Ayako is friends with Saotome too. He leaves her for now to her own devices. She seems like she'll be preoccupied enough for a while. In the boys' restroom on the same floor, he finds Toma shivering in his stall. He's burdened by guilt and intense fear. He still plays the fool and blames it all on Misao. Ikito calls to him and tells him to come along or cower. It's up to him. He complies, but only because he doesn't want to be left alone. Right when Ikito leaves the restroom, however, he hears glass shatter right behind him. He re-enters the room. Blood fills the porcelain sinks and blue walls. Red handprints line the interior of the broken room. The mirror is split in two with shards of glass on the floor. On top of the rummage is Toma's body. Thankfully, he's still breathing. Akito takes him to the second floor to library and has her shelter him for a bit. Now leaving him in hopefully safe hands, he hears something when he leaves. It sounds like rumbling. No, more like a banging noise. It's coming from a locker in one of the classrooms nearby. Very anxiously, Akito approaches it with caution. Opening the storage, a man comes tumbling out in an exasperated breath. It's Mr. Karata. He was sealed inside. Akito tries to talk to him, but before he can get a word in, Mr. Karata notices the ruin to the school and exits wanting to look around more. Back on the first floor, Ayaka seems to be gone. She's not inspecting her teacher's desk anymore. A little worrisome, but she should be alright. Just in case though, Akito searches the area. He finds the school's clinic with her and Mr. Karata inside. Ayaka is paralyzed in fear. She begs for Akito's help through a strained voice. She can barely form words. Mr. Karata states that a monster came in and attacked her. She barely escaped with her life. Karata also tells Akito that he'll stay with her until she calms down and tells him not to worry. 
With a sigh of relief, it's good to know at least his good friend will be safe not being alone anymore. Before he goes though, Karata asks one last thing of Akito. He says that there's a tranquilizer in his desk and asks him to grab it. It will help Ayaka relax. I assume tranquilizer may mean something like a sleeping pill in this case, because otherwise it'd be strange no matter you look at it. Akito agrees and goes back to the faculty room, but when he arrives at his desk, there's nothing to be found in there. Maybe he misplaced it. He decides to go back and ask his teacher what he did with it. When he opens the door to the infirmary, another ghastly sight awaits him. Ayaka is the first thing in his field of view. She's in a pool of her own blood with her hair splayed out on the textured flooring. She's not speaking. When he gets close to her body, he affirms that she is dead. Another one of his precious friends didn't make it through this nightmare they're living in. What's going on in here? What is Misao's curse and why did Ayaka have to die? Next to her is Karata with what looks like a stab wound up on the wall he's crouched upon. He's holding the wound in place. He claims a monster broke in and apologizes for not being able to protect his student. He seems regretful and sad. He tells Akito to keep exploring to end this nightmare and hands him something. And through a peek hole of the open container, Akito sees what looks to be severed hands. Karata says he found these while searching around and tells him that he knows Misao was in pain. She tried to talk to him before she disappeared, but he didn't make time for her. He says he could have saved Misao if he didn't turn her away then, but it's up to Akito now. Departing from his blood-soaked allies, in the women's restroom on the same first floor, a stall at the back is shut. Akito tries to open it, but to no avail. He knocks on it once, then again, and once more. Nothing happens. He leaves, but right as he gets to the entryway, the stall door swings ajar. The voice of a little girl by the name of Hanako is heard who asks him to play with her. The little ghost girl in red overalls comes out of the door. He could tell right away that she is dangerous. If he gets caught by her, he will die. They play a game of Ring Around the Rosy. Akito avoids her as she dashes towards him. They run around one another and he makes his way to the stall that opened. He finds an item in the toilet and it grosses Hanako out, scaring her away. Akito makes his way back to Toma, who's still with the library. He gives him a sports drink to help give him some life back. Toma seems to be doing much better now and thanks Akito, but he decides to stay in bed where it's safe and leaves the exploring all to him. He passes a laboratory on the second floor and comes to an examination room that would be in a hospital. On one of the makeshift tables, Yoshino cries out for help. She's chained to it and cannot get free. Akito tries to undo the bonds and she thanks him, but she also gives him some sass. Akito doesn't let it slip though and says that if he helps her, she needs to stop bullying. She agrees quickly, scared for her own life. Trying to get the bonds free, a loud groan is heard from outside the door. Not having enough time, Akito tells Yoshino to hold on and hides nearby, hoping it will pass. A sound of a chainsaw rips through the air. Yoshino cries at the noise, screaming no. But Akito, with no other choice, decides to stay completely still or else they'll both be caught. The chainsaw's rip finally cools down and seems to have faded gradually. Akito comes out of his hiding spot. It happened again. Another one of his friends slaughtered and he couldn't do anything about it. Not a piece of Yoshino is left but her hairband on the bloody examination table. The crazed man killed her. What a horrible way to go. The man is nowhere to be seen, but the remorse for not coming out of his spot earlier hits Akito hard. Another memory plays, this time of Yoshino. It shows her and her friends in a bathroom slapping and insulting Misao over Toma. Misao actually talks back and says that Toma will never want a girl like her. Yoshino takes the initiative and starts beating on her. Misao asks her to stop, but Yoshino, still mad, continues and even strips her clothing. She proceeds to take pictures of Misao and then throws her wallet in the toilet. The scene ends. Akito sees all of this and feels for Misao. He never knew that she went through that. After retrieving a couple more key items, allowing Akito to traverse new areas, he makes his way to the very back of the first floor, where the gymnasium is. It's a pretty generic looking school gym with a dusty interior, planked floors, and basketballs laying around. At the top of the gym, where assemblies must be held, is a landing, and Kudo is sitting in the middle of it. He's bleeding from the leg, and it looks like he can't move. Apparently, Kudo can hear the voice of Misao as well and says that they were childhood friends. He feels deep regret for Misao that he pushed her away. He wants her to be happy. Misao's ghost pops up out of nowhere just for a second to insult him, and then she proceeds to tell him that she never cared about him as much as he thought she did. 
Kudo screams out her name in pain, and the spotlight above falls directly onto him. His body is crushed underneath the glass of the fluorescent lights and the weight of the beam. Now we get to see what happened between them. A new memory starts once again. Kudo tells Yoshino to stop berating people. Yoshino goes over to Misao and tells her to buy her lunch with her money, casually bullying her. Kudo sees this scene play out, but this time he purposely averts his gaze and doesn't help. He says for a final time that it's all his fault. Onigawara is waiting on the first floor now after the scene ends. He tells Akito that the ritual needed to save Misao's soul is coming to a close. One more life is needed. Four lives that were born of her hatred must be taken to quench her soul. Technically four have died, but Ayaka and Misao never had any bad blood between one another, so she didn't attribute to this. He also says that Akito himself cannot be one of the sacrifices because he played the same role. But even so, Akito tries to volunteer. Three souls of Akito's friends fill the tombstones that lay in this otherworldly hellscape. One more needs to die. For whatever reason, Onigawara says Akito has the choice of who will be the sacrifice for the ritual. And the only two left alive are Toma and Mr. Karata. Toma led Misao on, and Mr. Karata disregarded Misao in her time of need. Both could technically work, but how does he make the choice? There is no right or wrong here. They're both people with lies ahead of them. Neither deserve to be murdered. Akito's mind is in a state of craze, thinking about what to do next. No matter how much he overthinks, he decides that no matter who did what, he can't kill Toma. He's just a kid. Mr. Karata is far older, so Akito approaches him from Misao and pushes away the weight in his mind all to save her. Kurata is barely conscious, against the same infirmary wall he left him at prior. Akito grips the metal bat in his fists, raising it above his head and promising he'll have relief soon. He lets out a guttural wail that echoes through the school. The bat now behind his back, he ends his scream and lowers his hands. A voice appears in his head. It's not Misao, but someone else. It tells him to do it, but he doesn't listen. He's no murderer, and he can't go through with it, even to save Misao. Akito goes alone to the altar in the courtyard and pleads to Misao to let him be the sacrifice. Anything to get away from this curse, he wants to help her. But to no avail. Library comes running in, saying spirits have overtaken the school. He runs back in to find Toma and Karata at the back of the first floor where Onigawara was. They're overlooking the deep void of the school below them. Akito tells them about the sacrifice. Before anyone speaks up, Mr. Karata says he will be the sacrifice. He won't let any more of his students die. Akito gives a speech to them to work together and get through this with Misao. He doesn't want to watch anyone else die, and he asks for their cooperation. Mr. Karata agrees and says that he played a part in all this, and he would do anything for his precious students. Toma, still worried, also calms down and asks if the others will come back if they get out. Silence fills the room for a moment when he says that. Toma bounces back and says that they're his friends and he wants to help them regardless, including Misao. He's on board. And for the first time since the beginning of the game, the air seems to be lighter again. The three of them will see this through together. Spectral hands rise up in an instant from the void, grabbing Toma on the right and Mr. Karata on the left. The hands of lost souls are trying to pull them down into whatever lies below the school. Each one barely grabs on to the craggy stone floor above their heads. Toma starts screaming and says he doesn't want to die. Mr. Karata says to get to Toma first. Akito doesn't have time to think. He lunges towards Toma and grabs his hands, essentially throwing him up back into the school grounds. Mr. Karata slips as this is happening, and the hands pull him into the black depths beneath the floor. Akito winces as he loses yet another person right in front of him. Toma is stunned at what just happened. Not wanting to waste time in this other world any longer, Akito makes a break for the altar now that all the souls have been gathered. Toma follows right behind him. The souls of their friends converge, and another memory plays. Yoshino is in the bathroom with Misao. She threatens her that if Misao doesn't play along, she'll release the pictures of her on her phone. A man enters the women's restroom, and Yoshino tells him to give her lots of love. Yoshino had somebody assault her in the bathroom, and Misao complied because she was scared of the blackmail. It's a much darker incident that has been shown so far, but Misao's torment doesn't stop there. This seems to be the memory of the last person to die, Mr. Karata. After this bathroom incident, he found her crying in the stall. She falls into her teacher's arms and confides in him. 
She tells him what was going on, but the strange thing that Akito recalls is that Mr. Kurata said he never spoke to Misao when he was in the infirmary. Something's off here. Kurata tells Misao he had similar things happen to him in school with bullying and they bond over it. Misao feels comfortable and happy for the first time in a bit. Looks like talking things out did in fact work to make her feel better and she's glad. Mr. Kurata gets up from his seat and proceeds behind her. He continues to say he's glad that she's not like the other girls. She's not dumb, and she is beautiful as well. Especially her hands, he states. He begins to touch her shoulders inappropriately. The air changes on a dime and becomes heavy. This isn't the Mr. Karata Akito knew. This isn't the kind and gentle teacher everyone spoke of. Misao starts to get creeped out, and then Karata licks her cheek. She slaps him immediately. She's terrified and runs to the corner of the room. The door is locked. Karata says that he locked it so nobody would see them. The teacher makes his way towards Misao with a sinister grin. She screams one last no before the screen goes dark. Heavy breathing plays in the background. When the picture comes back into view, Karata has his hands on his head as he whines with rage about how he's always rejected. He yells in dismay. Ms. Sao lays on the ground unconscious and fully clothed beside signs of a struggle. The teacher drags Ms. Sao to the bathroom with his head held low. He stops and drops her body in the center of the cold floor. His composure is back, it seems. He says, now you are mine, and proceeds to pull out a kitchen knife. One last time, the screen goes black. A gush of something soft is heard. Karata is then shown burying Misao's tragic body behind the school near the trees. The horridly disgusting memory finally comes to an end. The mystery of Misao has been solved. Mr. Karata murdered her in cold blood. Akito and Toma are back in reality now outside on the school roof. They've made it out of the nightmare, but they saw it all happen. Akito doesn't care about being back home yet. He runs down the stairs and out back of the building. He uses his hands to rip at the soil behind one of the classrooms, and there he finds it, her. Misao's rotted corpse is shown through the crack in the dirt. Heavy hand marks are imprinted around her neck, forever tainting her body. Akito is met with sadness and relief at finally finding her. Misao's ghost meets him and thanks him. The sun rises and hits them. Misao then disappears. Her soul must finally be at peace. Somebody finally looked out for her. Life returns to normal for now. Ikito and Toma's classmates don't seem to remember anyone else but them. Almost like the other students' existences had been erased. Who knows how the other world works, but it's not something he could do anything about right now. Also, for whatever reason, Misao's physical body disappeared along with her ghost. Ikito doesn't understand, but he regains some calm in knowing that she's okay and things are over. That is until she appears directly behind Toma in the middle of class. He was wrong. There's still a few things left unfinished. A new memory plays. This time, it's Akito's himself. It's when he first talked to Misao, she was helping a cat down from a tree. Misao knows whose cat this is, and she says she'll bring it back to them. Akito offers to help and come with her, but she rejects him and states that she could do this on her own, but she is smiling at the thought. She runs away quickly, and then Akito says to himself that his first impression of her was that she was very kind. The memory comes to a close, and he wakes up in another world again. Not the school this time, but a small area with tombstones on some platforms. Everything else is surrounded by the void. Onigawara stands in front of Akito as he wakes up. He says that the souls of his friends are still trapped, and he thinks they suffered enough. He offers a chance at liberation so they could be free. It's up to Akito to help with this. They won't be revived, but they can be born again. Onigawara has a lot of faith in this young boy for some reason. Is Akito a normal person, or is he something else entirely? Why was he able to achieve these things that the other characters couldn't? Regardless of his hand in it, the thought is nothing to dwell on for right now. Akito moves towards the first grave. It's kudos. It shows him protecting Misao when they were kids. They played on the playground, and he was her hero. Then once they grew up, she watched him get bullied for being close to the gloomy girl known as Misao. Kudo seems much edgier now and tells them to shut up. He leaves the room and Misao waits for him outside. She asks him to go home with her and Kudo tells her not to talk to him again and storms off. 
The vision is followed by the current Kudo lying on the ground crying as a bunch of Misaos tell him he is trash and deserves to die. Once again, he goes back to repeating, it's all my fault. Ikito breaks through to him and says Misao is not the type of person who would say these things. He should know that most. It works and the real Misao shows up. Misao says she knows he was always watching her and felt pain for abandoning her. She says it made her happy that she thought of him. Kudo cries one last time and is born into a baby right in front of Akito. The next grave is of Yoshino. She's bullying Misao once again in the art room. In the restroom next door, many Misaos are kicking Yoshino over and over. They're beating on her as Yoshino begs for forgiveness. Ikito dispels the spirits of Misaos with salt. Ikito lectures Yoshino on what she did and says she understands and won't bully ever again. Just like Kudo, she becomes a baby born anew. After her comes Saotome. Saotome purposefully compares herself to Misao in front of everyone to make herself look good. Not just in appearance, but in personality, too, for being so kind. Her hell loop is watching Toma fall in love with Misao over and over. Misao plays into Toma as they confess to each other, and Saotome toils in agony in the background. Ikito tells her Toma ran away from her, and to remember what happened, that this is an illusion. She goes silent for a bit, and then asks Akito for his bat. She grips it and trots over before proceeding to scream and hit Toma for leaving her. When she kills the image that plagued her, she also becomes a baby. Before the last grave though, there's a hairpin on the ground. It's Ayaka's. Akito touches it and finally sees what happened to her. When she was in the faculty room looking through the drawers, Ayaka finds the bag of human hands Mr. Karata had. Mr. Karata busts in at the perfect time and retrieves them from her. Ayaka trembles and sees how crazy he is as he licks the hands. She sprints down the hallway, screeching, and he chases her all the way to the infirmary. Karata has her cornered and claims that she has to die now that she knows his secret. Ayaka is too horrified to move, and this is where Akito came in and talked to them prior. Ayaka lets out a soft help but Karata swiftly jumps on it and says that monsters attack them and he'll watch over her. She's just panicking right now. Akito needs to get back to searching. Ayaka doesn't make out another word because she's stunned speechless. Akito leaves the room and Ayaka runs towards the door too, but she trips and Karata walks over menacingly and pulls out his trusty knife. He stabs the poor girl and then cuts himself so he has an alibi for when Akito returns. It ends there. The only grave left is Karata's himself. It shows the teacher in the school halls and a few girls are talking about how attractive and sweet he is. He runs to the bathroom overhearing this and stammers on in anger about how appearance isn't everything. He grabs his face in displeasure. The next scene shows Mr. Karata as a kid and his younger face was much duller and flawed. His hair was scraggly. When he went to school, he'd get bullied by all those around him. On the way home from school, he saw an abandoned cat and tried to take care of it. But it was already too sick from being out in the cold. He buried the cat and let it rest in peace from then on. Much like Akito's memory of Misao, it's nearly synonymous. After more students bully him, a green-haired girl comes up to Karata behind the school and tells him she doesn't want to turn a blind eye to the bullying anymore. She hangs out with him and he appreciates it. Karata claims he doesn't want her to get bullied as well and says not to hang out with them, but she says she will come to see him more anyway. He felt accepted for the first time in his life. They talk more and time passes day by day, but Karata's feelings slowly start to change for more than just friends. He decided to tell her and he was barely able to start making the words out when he awkwardly gripped her arm. She repelled at the sudden touch and said she never got close to him with those feelings in mind. She just felt bad for him. The green-haired girl told him that they shouldn't meet anymore. He lost the only person who didn't treat him like trash. Karata fell into despair from the rejection. A second of calm was met with yelling at why everyone rejects him. He lunges at the girl and puts his hands around her neck. They're both screaming and a teacher notices coming over to help. The last frame is of current Karata stabbing Misao's corpse over and over. He continues stammering and whining about not being accepted, like a child deprived of what everyone else has that he doesn't. 
Ikito moves closer to him and tells him that everyone did call him kind and thoughtful. Ikito saw him the same way, and that was always who he was deep down. It wasn't about appearance, and the only person who ever felt that way was himself. Mr. Karata recoils and understands. His younger self cries out for being told these words he had always been waiting for. The cat that he took care of for a period of time is able to be reborn anew. Mr. Karata faced himself and saved a life in the end. All is mostly said and done, but to the north of this dark blackout of a world, one last tombstone exists. It's Toma's. He's not dead, but Misao had just dragged him back over here. When inside, it's just Misao, Toma, and Akito. Akito calls to Misao to not take Toma, and she confirms that she knows that Toma was only toying with her, and it was as simple as that. She loves him, but she hates him though, all the same. She asks Akito to be her boyfriend in his place. Toma wakes up and realizes where he is, but he runs out of the shot in fright at the darkness around him. Misao doesn't want to be seen as a monster, but it makes her feel like one. She sees herself in a reflection, and only sees a demonic version of herself with red eyes and a broken skin. She wails with a mountain of negative emotions. She wanted to be happy and live a life. She wanted to have friends. She asks Akito to be her boyfriend one more time. Akito declines, saying that he wants to treat their friendship with care, so he would never want to jump into something like that before they know each other better. He calms her down, and he continues that he always wanted to be her friend. He likes her, and he won't let her be alone ever again. Misao sniffles up her tears at everything that's happened. She had been waiting for a real friend, somebody who would go out of their way for her. He was here. Ikito asks once more, Misao, will you be my friend? Her tears turn to tears of joy as she replies with a simple, yes. They smile and finally part from one another as she has found her peace. Akito wakes up in the classroom back in the real world. On the chalkboard reads, Thank you. This ends Misao. Misao is a great RPG Maker game, and I see why it's so popular. I enjoyed it more than Mad Father, which is the other game by the same developer. The narrative is told straightforwardly and doesn't get tedious as I made my way through. It's a good story about empathy between a cast that didn't care much for one another before the events of the plot play out. If there's one thing I wasn't a big fan of, it was that the main character is essentially a random person with no past, and that's why he's able to help everyone out. But I understand that they needed a hero, at the very least. Also, the game itself has so many different ways to die in it, and I loved how easily you could trigger something leading to a ridiculous death. The switch up on the Corpse Party Hell School landscape thing was done well too. It felt very original in comparison. If Corpse Party and Misao had similar themes, I feel like Misao was written with a much lighter tone overall and made for a much more feel-good ending. Thanks for watching all the way through if you did, and let me know if you'd like to see Mad Father covered next or some other RPG Maker horror game. This is part of a series where I cover indie game stories all the way through, and if that's your thing, there's more on the channel along with more indie game content in general. Like and subscribe and all that if you want to. Goodbye!